Hello plant people, Nora the Lekker Queen. Welcome to yet another plant Q&A session. Thank you for all the questions that you put in and continue to put in. And don't forget on Monday, the new Q&A session post goes up. So please go put in your questions for the next session. Let's jump straight into it. First question, do you own calatheas? If so, how are they handling lecker? Yes, I do own calatheas. I think I have three calatheas at the moment. The latest calathea that I've got is this one here. This one is the calathea Louisa Thai Beauty. Goodness, look at this gorgeous mama. She is doing so well living in Lekka. That's her reservoir there. I've just recently put her into Lekka, but so far, I think it's safe to say that she's loving it so far. It's early days yet, so who knows what's gonna happen, but I have great hopes for this one. I'll show you another Calathea that I've got living in Lekka. This is a Calathea fasciata. Oh, she's a big mama. She's living in a 20 centimeter pot, if you can believe it. Lots of lecker in that pot. I put this plant in this 20 centimeter pot because I couldn't find anything between a 14 centimeter and a 20 centimeter, which is clear. So she's living in that pot. So far, so good. Um, it hasn't been the growing season here in Melbourne. So this plant is still going a little bit slowly but I reckon you know things are about to pick up for this one so I'm very very hopeful I do have another one my calathea orbifolia I whack that out all the time I'm not going to bring her out today because I think some people might be a bit tired of looking at her I'm certainly tired of carrying her because she lives in a huge 20 centimeter pot and she's just everywhere if you haven't seen her before just click on the video above that shows you that calathea in all her glory. I think my calatheas are loving Lekka. I have had calatheas in soil before and things have not gone well. Lots of crispy calatheas in my past, I can tell you that for sure. But they're definitely seeming to like the fact that they've got consistent nutrition, they've got consistent water supply, and I think that's really, really helping. Are all calatheas loving Lekka? You know, like Rattlesnake, Freddy, and so on. Honestly, can't say that all calatheas love lecker because I haven't tried all calatheas. All plants are different. So who knows, you know, would I try all calatheas in lecker? Yes, I would. And that's really the only way to find out and answer that question. And what works in lecker in, in my environment might not work in lecker in your environment. So really the only way to know with a question like this is to grab a plant, put it in lecker, do your best and see how you go. So, and, and of course, I just don't have the space in my home to try all the plants. And some plants I don't really like the look of, so I probably will never have them. I will never try them in Lekka, but I certainly encourage you to give it a go and see how you get on. You've surely bought a bunch of plants. Are there any secrets to buying cheap quality plants? No secrets whatsoever. I buy my plants from all sorts of places. And once you've been collecting plants for a while, like I have, you find that the local nursery doesn't quite cut it. You know things are bad when you go into the store that everybody goes to to buy plants, right? Which for me in Australia is Bunnings. Most people go to Bunnings to get a plant. When I walk into a Bunnings, I look around and I think, I have that, 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 or if I don't have it, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that, I don't want that. And I'll walk out of there with nothing because they can't supply me with what I need now. I get a lot of my plants from Facebook. There are lots of specialist groups on Facebook. So in Australia, you've got pages like rare aeroid groups, Hoya groups, things like that. And I'm sure there are similar groups in places where you are, where people are selling plants that are not as readily available because they're collectors. So they've got these plants and they're selling them on to other people. So those are a good source. Instagram is also a very good source of plants. That's where I get a lot of my plants. Again, you've got a 
lot of collectors who've got large, large greenhouses and with all sorts of exotic plants and they're selling them off. I get a lot of my plants from a person called The Mellow Pot. She's got absolutely glorious plants, very well priced. I get my plants from her. Another plant supplier for me is called shoots galore that's a lovely lady who i know is relatively local and because i buy from these people quite regularly i know the quality of the stock i know the plants being well taken care of i know i'm getting a good decent plant once you start to collect there's there's a few places that you know you can get plants that are pretty decently priced as well but another place that i'm so so grateful for that you know I live in Melbourne so I'm really really lucky to be able to go to this place called Collector's Corner and Collector's Corner is Hoya heaven if you live in Melbourne and you have not been to Collector's Corner and you love Hoyas I don't know what you're doing you need to go to Collector's Corner that place is just absolutely amazing I try not to go to Collector's Corner because every time I go there I am going to spend not less than a hundred dollars on Hoyas and these are plants like like oh my god there's a Hoya Imbricata or oh my god there's a Hoya Suzy Q and you see other people selling a Hoya Suzy Q for $70. You go to Collector's Corner, it's like 20, you know, so go to Collector's Corner. So yeah, I could rant on all day as to where I get my plants, but that's, that's where I get my plants. Next question. This is a really interesting one. I had a right giggle when I read this one. It says, how much effort goes into making a video? And I loved how they went and said, genuinely curious. <laughs> it's just completely so unrelated to plants, but it's, it's, yeah, I, I really, first of all, I really appreciated the question because that for me goes to show that, you know, you really appreciate that it does take a lot to make videos. Actually, it's quite fun. I enjoy the process, but there's a lot of planning that goes into it as well. So there's different kinds of videos. There's simple videos like this one. Q and A's are actually some of my favorite. I learn a lot when I'm doing Q and A's and they're not as difficult to get together as the other videos. So I'll just do my research. And if I've got a plant, you know, I'll just do a little plant demo and that's pretty much it that's easy and i'll go off i'll edit the video and that's that but there's other videos that it take a lot longer to get through because you've got the follow-up period as well so i know i've got about three videos in production right now so i have filmed part a where i've done the first bit and i'm now waiting for the plants to do something so i can then show you what the plant has done and say look this is what i did with this plant and now it's been a month later this is what the plant is doing so it makes it a bit more of an enjoyable watch for you and you get that instant result like you've seen this plant you've you're invested in this story you want to know the conclusion you don't want to have to wait for yeah it's it does take a while to get these and so you need to have you, you need to have planned all this you need to look at the seasons is this plant going to grow while i'm waiting for this to happen and then in the meantime what other videos am i putting out while i'm waiting for this video to get together so videos like um the when I chopped up my golden ivy that video took a while to make because I had to go get the plant chop it up and then I had to wait for the growth points to grow before I could film the second part of the video and make it a complete journey so it's it, it does take a bit of a while but once you get through all that that's the filming and then you have to sit down and do the editing because there's lots of bloopers when I'm filming, there's lots of redundant film that actually ends up on the cutting room floor, so to speak, and all that stuff needs to get sorted and tightened up. And when I'm making my videos, I ramble on, I just ramble on forever. And when I'm editing is when I'm like, yeah, no, Nora, nobody's interested in listening to that crap. So I'll take all that stuff out and hopefully leave only what's relevant. And then after you do that, and then have to download it and then I upload it onto YouTube. And then I have to go in and make sure that my subtitles are relatively okay. One of the things I absolutely loathe is when I'm watching a video on YouTube, most of the time I actually don't have the sound on. So I like to watch with the subtitles on, but most of the time, 
you, subtitles that YouTube makes automatically are wrong. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense. So what I've started to do now is I, I am editing my subtitles, making sure that my subtitles are correct. Hopefully that makes it easier for you when you're watching and makes it a better experience for people who actually do need to have the subtitles on and not necessarily that that's a preference. So that's, that's what goes into making a video apart from going in and making the thumbnail and making all the other things that, you know, you have to do as a YouTuber, but it's an enjoyable experience. It truly is, but it, it is a lot of work and it does take a lot of commitment. I will not lie, but I love it. Have you tried using tree fern fiber? as medium. So this person has tried soil, they've tried leka, they've tried pawn, and they're now thinking about using tree fern fiber. This is one of the ones that went, that got me going like, oh, what is tree fern fiber? I had no idea what tree fern fiber was. So this is a perfect example of why I love these sessions. If they're not just for you, they're for me. I learned so much. So of course I had to go off and learn all about tree fern fiber. I was like, oh, this stuff is absolutely fantastic. Tree fern fiber is derived from native tree ferns in New Zealand. So they get these trees and they make this fiber and it's a loose kind of fiber. It's a really loose substrate, very airy and works very, very well. There's a lovely video that's been produced by a good friend of mine, a YouTuber, Click on the link above and that'll take you to her video. And that really just explains everything there is to know about tree fern fiber. I wouldn't even attempt to do anything more, but direct you to that video. That is the best one that I've seen that talks about tree fern fiber. I would love to actually try it out. Doesn't seem to be as readily available as sphagnum moss here in Australia. I think I could only find some links on eBay and things like that, but I will hunt it down because I would love to see how it works with my anthurium seeds. If you can get it, I would highly encourage you to give it a go, see how you like it and see how it works for your plant. Let us know how you go in the comments below. I have mildew growing on the inside of my pots to the level of the water line. On my opaque pots, the mildew is on the outside of the pot at the water line. Do you experience this problem? Any suggestions on how to eliminate the mildew? Yeah, this one got me a little bit stumped. I'm, I'm not sure. The first thing that I'm wondering is by mildew, do you mean mold? Do you mean actual fungus? I would really love a clarification on what it is you mean. If you can jump onto my Instagram and send me a picture, I'd really love to look into this for you a lot more, but I think every, anything that I would say at this point would just be me waffling. Please jump onto my Instagram, send me a picture if you can, thanks. Can you remember when you thought to try Lekka for the first time and what was the main motivation? And did you have any early fails that put you off using it? I remember very well when I decided to try Lekka for the first time. It was just after we had left one of our big lockdowns in Melbourne and my life was really starting to pick up again. I had so many things to do with the kids. I didn't have all weekend to take care of my plants like I used to. And every time I went to look at my Hoyas, all the little leaves were just dropping off, dropping off. All the new growth was just dropping off and my Hoyas were dry and I just couldn't get that consistency of watering. And at that point is when I decided, right, I need to try this semi-hydro business. At least my plants are going to have that consistent water supply as opposed to this where my watering was just so erratic and I just couldn't get that steady medium. So I decided to try Lekka and that worked really well for me. Did I have any early fails? Thankfully I didn't. I didn't have any fails that, that put me off. And I think this is largely because of the plants that I chose to put into Lekka first. So the first plants I put into Lekka were my Hoyas. So and Hoyas love Lekka, so that worked really, really well. I put my spider plants in Lekka. Spider plants do so well in Lekka as well. And this is one of the first spider plants that I put into Lekka. Look at what those roots were doing. It was just absolutely magical. From that point on, I was hooked and I just started putting every plant that I could find into Lekka. And even when I 
failed, there was no turning back because I was already hooked. And when I did fail, I didn't see that as a problem with the lecker or with the method. I saw that as a problem with me and what I'm doing and I need to fix what I'm doing. And then when I fix it, the plant will be fine. So I think that's what's really helped me. It's just my attitude to the lecker. It's like do or die. I'm not going back to soil. This has got to work. And if the plant absolutely refuses and I just can't get round to getting it to grow and by plant I am looking at you string of pearls then I just won't have it you know and till I feel like trying again I just will not have it. Another very very funny question from a lovely lovely person I love her. Um, why are you so amazing inside and out? Even the plants thrive around you. Now that is just the sweetest thing. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I mean you don't even really know me so but you think that I am amazing inside and out that's that's a fabulous compliment and I take it in the spirit in which it's given thank you I try but you know I'm a human being I've got my foibles I've got my things that most many people don't like about me and whatever but I try my best I, I, I can only try my best and that's what I do same thing I do for my plants I try my best that is all I can do really and, and that's all anyone can do all you can do is try your best and that's it and live your best life with what you've got that's me what you see is what you get thank you for that interesting question slash lovely comment is lecker readily available in your country yes lecker is very readily available in Australia and I think it is readily available in a lot of other countries as well. so I guess it depends on the country that you're in person wants to know how can you tell what's good quality lecker don't want to buy any crap lecker what's good quality lecker any tips oh this is a tough one there's always good and bad with anything and the thing as well is lecker is not generally available in like big nurseries and things like that because growing in hydroponics or semi-hydroponics is really a subculture places like hydroponics shop you go to a hydroponics shop you will find clay bowls everywhere now I know you're thinking you don't have a hydroponics shop where you live that is probably not true I'm not saying you're lying I'm just saying that you probably aren't aware of them because before I started using Lekka I didn't even know about hydroponics shop. I had a hydroponics shop like five minutes from my house and I did not see it because, you know, it had nothing to do with me. So I didn't bother. But there's lots of hydroponics shops and I know there's lots of hydroponics shops because there's lots of people who actually grow their plants in a hydro environment. And when I say people growing plants, I say, I mean, there's lots of people who grow plants in their house and they use hydroponics plants so they're there they're there it's a subculture they're there so just look around in your area you know google up hydroponics shop near me or something like that and you will find them they're there and in terms of getting quality lecker I would call up the hydroponics shop and ask them what kind of lecker do you supply ask them what's a good kind of lecker a good quality lecker and trust me, they will tell you because they know, because they do sell it. There is lecker out there where you are. You just don't know because it hasn't been on your radar. They really are quite a good resource. So I'd certainly recommend that you use them. But even if you don't have hydroponics shops near you, you might have a hydroponic shop maybe in the next state or in the next town. You can call them and ask them what's a good brand to use and they would direct you. What you'll find is some, some brands have very, very round balls. Other brands have got more irregular balls. You might find that other brands have got large size lecker mixed in with smaller lecker and so on. So it's, it all just depends. But what I like to do is I've bought all sorts of different brands along my lecker journey. And because I eventually end up mixing my lecker invariably, my lecker is made up of all different sizes and all different shapes. So when you look at this lecker, you've got smaller ones, you've got bigger ones, you've got rounder ones, and you've got more irregular shaped ones. And this works really, really well for the roots. So the take home message here is find a hydroponic shop, give them a call, 
ask them what's a good brand to use and where you can find it and away you go. Question, once your plants reach the top of their pole, what do you do? Will you prop the top and plant it in a new pot to start again and get even larger leaves? Well, this is a very easy question. I've actually got two videos where I discuss what I do. So my plants reach the top of the pole, what do I do? I chop the plant in half, I put the top half into Lekka and let the bottom half keep growing and I'll extend that moss pole and I'll have two plants. I might give away one or I might keep both depending on how I feel, but that's pretty much what I do. So it's not really chopping and propping because I'm not getting a small cutting. I'm literally cutting the plant in half and having it continue growing without disturbing the tip. So the new leaves that are growing continue to be big and the stem continues to be thick and all the rest of this kind of thing. And if you haven't seen my videos where I chop a plant, click on the link above and that'll take you through to a video where I chop my golden ivy that's reached the top of its moss pole. And I'll also show you what I do with the bottom part of it and actually what happens to the plant when you do that chop. The growth points appear and the plant continues to grow. So go and take a look at that video and that will answer all your questions. Thank you. Do you think it's good to combine different materials? So materials like lecker, moss, orchid bark in my new orchid plant. I think it's always good to combine materials depending on what you're doing because each material has got a different characteristic and is bringing something to the table. So for example, if you're growing your plants in soil, you put things like, you might put lecker, you might put bark, you might put horticultural charcoal, and all that enhances your soil. Definitely, I would encourage you to do that if that's what you're doing. But because I'm using lecker, I'm not mixing anything with the lecker. The lecker is sufficient to do the job that I needed to do, so hence, I don't do any mixing. But if you're using other products apart from lecker, Mixing is not a bad idea. <laughs> I love this question. How much did Kill This Plant pay you to cameo in his video? Now, a little bit of background about this question. Kill This Plant is a lovely YouTuber called Lee from Canada, and he makes lots of very interesting YouTube videos, and he is very ingenious. He creates all sorts of things. And he has created a moss pole and he calls his video, I have made the best moss pole, believe it or not, which is fine. <laughs> and he's a lovely guy. He approached me to take a look at his video and ask me what I thought. And I gave him my thoughts and he said to me, would you like to cameo in my video? And I thought, why not? Because I love a bit of fun. So I cameoed in his video. And if you haven't seen it, click on the link above, that'll take you straight to it. And you have to wait to get right to the end and you will see yours truly, the Lekka Queen cameoing in that video. It was such a fun thing to do. And I really would like to do more collaborations. Do you think I should do more collaborations? If you do, let me know in the comments below and also give some suggestions of who you think I could collaborate with. I'd be really interested in hearing that. But the answer to your question is no, Lee did not pay me anything to cameo in his video. I was happy to do it. I was glad to do it and I was honored to be asked. Looking at your moss poles, I noticed that they're green. There's algae growing on your moss poles. That indeed is true. What should you do? Should you remove it? What causes the algae? How can you remove it? This is my philodendron Brazil. And if you look closely at this moss pole, indeed, there's algae growing on this moss pole. So that green sort of powdery substance on top of that brown moss is algae. Now, the question is, why is there algae? So first of all, algae is present everywhere. Algae spores are present everywhere and all they need is a good environment for them to seed and start to proliferate. What's caused the algae to grow on this moss pole is that one, the moss pole is moist. So 
there's water and the algae can latch onto and then there's nutrition. I spray this moss pole with my nutrient solution so that moss has nutrition in it. The other thing is that this moss pole has got brilliant light. I give it brilliant light because I want my philodendron Brazil to look fabulous like it does right now. So if you provide these three things, nutrition, water and light, algae will thrive. The algae will bloom, which is exactly what's happened here. Is this a problem? Not really. Algae becomes a problem when you have so much of it, it starts to compete for nutrition with your plant. At this stage, as it is, I'm not too worried about this algae, to be honest with you. In fact, when I see algae on my moss poles, it tells me that I'm doing the right thing. I'm keeping my moss poles moist and I am, my plant is receiving the light that it needs. So that's the side effect of actually doing the right thing by a moss pole. Do I want to get rid of it? Am I concerned about that? I probably would not do anything about that, to be honest. I've got two million plant things that I need to do. Getting rid of algae on moss poles is nowhere on my priority list. It's just not worth the effort as far as I'm concerned. But if you did want to tackle it because it annoys you so, you can use hydrogen peroxide. So 3% hydrogen peroxide is a good product to use. You can find anywhere. So I've got mine over here. I buy that from the chemist, the supermarket, anywhere. It's very, very readily available. So you're putting about five mils of the hydrogen peroxide in about 240 mils of water. Make a solution there. So I've got that in my little squeezy bottle and you will spray that. And in theory, the algae might start to die. It might be that you probably have too much algae for that little 3% to work. I don't know. I mean, if, if you tackle it earlier rather than later, you might have better success rate. I'm not sure how much of this I'm going to be able to get rid of on this philodendron Brazil, but it's not something that I'm too bothered with, to be honest. Am I worried that the hydrogen peroxide is going to affect my plant? That dilution rate it is so weak, it's not likely to do anything to your plant. And in fact, remember, when you've got root rot, you're soaking your plant in hydrogen peroxide. So it's not really going to damage your plant. And is this going to affect your nutrient solution in your reservoir? Look, you're not putting so much that it's dripping into your reservoir. So I don't think that would really be an issue. So, you know, just a little bit, just that and that's it. That does the job. So, you know, if, if you're concerned about algae on your moss pole, I would try this. Let me know how it goes. I haven't done it myself but this is what I know in theory could work. So let me know in the comments below if you have tried it and if it's worked out for you. Does the pH actually change a lot over time? This is a very scientific question, which I hesitate to respond to without doing an experiment. My scientific mind says, I need to do an experiment in order for me to say, yes, it changes a lot. No, it doesn't change a lot. And doing that experiment will involve listing the variables that would actually affect how much the pH changes. And some of those would include light, it would include how much of the nutrient solution is in the reservoir, it would include what kind of pH testing I'm using, what was the initial pH, how much the plant has grown so many variables. I don't know if I could do an experiment like that justice, to be honest. All I know is the pH does change. Does the pH change enough to warranty you changing the nutrient solution regularly? Yes, it does. Should you change your nutrient solution regularly at least once a week or once every fortnight? Yes, you should, because that pH does change. I actually thought about testing the pH of one plant, like just testing the pH every day. That seemed like a lot of work. I might do it. I probably will do it at some point. And I thought, look, it might be easier if I actually get an electronic 
pH tester, you know, instead of just using the eyeballing method with the pH tester that I've got, because at that point I'm just estimating, I'm going, hmm, this is about six or hmm, it's about 6.5. Nah. So in order to do this experiment properly, I need to get like a proper digital pH meter. When I get one of those, I will do that experiment and we will answer that question accurately. But yes, that did get me thinking. So thank you for that question. Should you put a plant in a smaller pot just to cover the roots? I've had a few fails that I think might have been from planting in too large a pot. So you really don't want to be using too large a pot. There is no need for it. And especially if you're planting your plants in soil, using too large a pot means you've got a lot of soil sitting in this pot. And when you water your plant, all that soil is holding on to moisture and you water your plant and then you'll come back again in a week and you water it again. There's still water in that soil because there's so much soil and then you water it again. The chances of your plant getting root rot are a lot higher and that is the problem with putting a plant in a very, very big pot. What do you do to clean lecker for reuse? Every time I clean mine, I spend hours picking up random roots and leaves that I find. That's, that's so funny. But that's just so true for cleaning leka. Cleaning leka sometimes can be a bit annoying. But one of the things that I do is every time I'm taking a plant out of leka and putting the leka away for cleaning, I immediately at that point start sieving out, you know, taking out the roots and whatever leaves are in there, just so I don't have this great big mound that I have to go through. But I did see a very interesting video on YouTube once. I think it's from the hydroponics guy. I'm not sure what he's called. I think he's called the hydroponics guy. Anyway, so he's got this video where he lets his lecker dry, right? The lecker that he's going to use, he lets it completely dry and then he takes it outside and he's got a fan on, a rotary fan on standstill and it's going and then he drips he, he sort of gets his lecker and pours it down from a distance and that fan is going and that fan is blowing off all the dry bits i wish i could have demonstrated this to you but you know going to set up outside was just way too much of a bother if I can find the video, I'll put the link up above, but that's one way of doing it. I thought that's really ingenious. That's one thing, but I always just pick out those things before it gets too much. That's what I do. I love the idea of the philodendron mame in a clear pot. And the person's not sure if I'm using a cash pot for the philodendron mame. And how do I change the nutrient solution? This here is my philodendron mame living in a DIY rectangular pot. So I made this rectangular pot and if you haven't seen the video where I do that, just click on the link above and that'll take you straight to it. So it doesn't need a cash pot. The only reason I put an outer pot is because I wanted it to look pretty, but I don't even use that anymore. I just have it there like that. And what's really interesting is I don't have any algae growing there yet. So I put the nutrient solution there and not sure if you can see the level there, but that's sort of, I put it below there and that's where it sits. Now, the question is, how do I change the nutrient solution? So I do flush this plant, I'll take it to a sink, I'll put water through it and all the water will start to come out through the little holes, right? But of course, you're still going to have that. So what I do, I'll bring it down. So I've got this bowl to help me demonstrate. What I do is I just tip that over. And that comes out. So this is the solution that I would have used to flush the plant. And I can take all of it out doing that. Once that's completely empty, I will just top up with a nutrient solution fresh nutrient solution. And that's how I do that. And this plant is doing really, really well. So I think that's working. Yeah, that's how I do that. How is the silver cloud different from the philodendron mame? I'm not sure what I have. Ooh, that is a good question. I'll grab my silver cloud and we'll take a look at the two plants. 
So this is my philodendron mummy. And the philodendron mummy has got more elongated leaves than the silver cloud. This is the silver cloud. The leaves of the silver cloud are heart shaped. They're a lot rounder. When you put those two leaves side by side, you can see that this one has got more of a heart shape and is rounder. And this one is longer. That's the first thing. The other difference is when you look at the silver cloud, the silver cloud is a lot more silvery than the philodendron mummy. That's the mummy there, not as silvery as the silver cloud, hence the name silver. So let's take a look at the petioles of the two plant. This here is the petiole of a silver cloud. When you look at that petiole, it's more, it's very wavy, it looks a bit like the petiole of a Monstera deliciosa. If you just look, it's got lots of these raised ridges. I'll show you the petiole of a mummy. The petiole of a mummy is not as ragged as that of the silver cloud. So you can see it's not as ruffled. It doesn't have that pattern that makes it look like the petiole of a Monstera deliciosa. But the other really distinct thing is looking at that petiole, it's, it's got that reddish tinge to it. And the silver cloud doesn't have that similar reddish tinge that the mummy has. And on that silver cloud mummy note, that is the end of this week's Q&A session. Thank you so much for all the questions that you put in. Don't forget to put in a new set of questions for the next Q&A. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe and I will see you in my next video. Thank you. Goodbye.